Hello and uh, welcome to the debate. I'm Marzi Hashimi. Thanks so much for being with us. As the northern Syrian city of Kobani continues to be under attack by ISIL terrorists, more and more people are looking at Turkey's inaction in this situation. Now, the Kurdish city of Kobani sits near the Turkish border, and as the international community has called for anyone to do whatever they can to help the Kurds in Kobani, Ankara won't even let the Kurds inside of Turkey who want to go to help fight ISIL depart Turkish territory. Clashes are taking place inside of Turkey because of the government's stance, and tens of people have already been killed as Turkish police crack down on Kurds, and Ankara simply looks the other way. Kobani continues resisting in the face of a brutal offensive by ISIL Takfiri militants. The ISIL has been trying to fully capture the northern Kurdish city. Its latest raid on Kobani has been repelled by the Kurdish defenders. Reports from the battlefield say Kurdish fighters have inflicted heavy losses on ISIL militants while they are trying to make further advances. The militants have captured some areas of Kobani only a stone's throw from the Turkish territory. Turkey has deployed tanks and other weapons along its border with Syria. But it's just watching the Syrian border city being strangled by well-equipped ISIL militants. Ankara has come under immense pressure over its stance on the situation in Kobani and the ISIL. It just refuses to allow any military hardware or aid to be sent to the defenders of Kobani. Ankara says any assistance to the civilians in Kobani is conditional on the U.S. and its allies hitting the Syrian government forces alongside the ISIL militants. Turkey should give assistance to the defenders of Kobani. It should open a corridor through which assistance and arms can be sent to people. Turkey has openly supported the insurgents fighting to topple the Syrian government over the past years. A founder of Turkey's ruling AK Party has confirmed this. Danger Mir Mehmet Ferhat says Ankara has made substantial concessions to terrorist groups in an effort to hamper the Kurds' efforts to establish autonomy in the north of Syria, which is densely populated by the Kurds. Ferhat criticized the Turkish government's policy in Syria as a miscalculation. Uh, Turkey has a double game going on here, uh, but they are not the only ones. Uh, uh, the thing that struck me the most here is uh, Turkey has really has invested a lot in the past uh, to kind of cool things down uh, with the Kurds. They made a strategic decision to uh, uh, try to give them their autonomy and to stop having problems with the Kurds. And of course, what's happening now, he's really risking erasing all of that investment uh, that was made uh, by blocking the reinforcements going in. He's really letting Kobani twist in the wind here with the threat of a slaughter. Turkey, along with some regional Arab states and the United States, has done its utmost to help bring about regime change in Syria. Ankara has allowed the militants from all extremist groups to use its territory to sneak into Syria to join the insurgency against Damascus. The policy hasn't paid off. Instead, it has fueled concerns inside Turkey, with critics of the Turkish government describing Ankara's stance as counterproductive. I'd like to welcome my guest to the program out of uh, Washington, D.C., a member of the Congressional Defense Policy or Congressional Defense Policy Advisor, Mr. Frederick Peterson, and out of Orlando, Florida, former American intelligence linguist, Mr. Scott Record. Thank you both for being with us. Uh, let's start this off in uh, Washington, D.C., and uh, Mr. Peterson. Well, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has said that there is no difference for him between the Kurds who want to go and fight ISIL and ISIL itself, what does that say to you about the Turkish leader's stance? And where does that leave the Kurds in Kobani if they were hoping for some help to come from Turkey? Well, what is happening, I think what we're seeing play itself out here is a general weakening of NATO, uh, both its command authority, its moral leadership, and its actual physical leadership and able to, ability to conduct policy. This is a result of, uh, of many things going on within the uh, constituent members of, of NATO, particularly the United States and the refusal, literally, of the United States to assert itself in leadership in that part of the world rather than mere window dressing and ornaments on a tree we also see in Turkey kind of a, 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 a policy that is contradicting itself. On the one hand, they run tanks to a border. They make general statements about uh, 
uh, support of NATO policy, support of international policy against this alliance, against this thug, uh, brutish uh, force that presumes to call itself the Islamic State, uh, uh, and yet is a tremendous challenge not only to uh, Turkey mm -hmm. all, and to the region, but to the world. And what we have is the Turks are conflicted because even within themselves, they have constituent groups that are vying for power and they do not have strong dynamic leadership in the, uh, in the, in the uh, tradition, shall we say, of Kemal Ataturk, mm -hmm. who took the, what was known as the sick man of Europe, uh, that being Turkey in the last century, and emerged as a strong, powerful force bridging East and West mm -hmm. and becoming a, a, a rather significant player in the world. We see Turkey, as we see other constituent players, slipping back into history, into the mire, and becoming a, a, a contradiction within themselves, not able to stand up to the thugs of the Islamic State or ISIL or whatever they choose to call well, well, themselves Mr. Peterson, today. I, I want to look at uh, the brutish state. Okay, yes. Mr. Peterson, I, I want to look at one Go part. Ahead. I'm of, sorry. I'm sorry. I want to look at one part of what you had said that basically it's a sign of a NATO basically having problems within itself and perhaps the beginning of the end of NATO. Why do you say that? I want to look at that aspect of what you have just said. Well. Uh, we see the uh, the uh, deputy uh, leader of the uh, British, or the, excuse me, the German uh, Bundestag, coming out uh, the, uh, representing the Green Party, a woman, a strong woman, uh, demanding that Turkey stand up and fulfill its responsibilities to the principles of the NATO and European alliance, and in fact to all of humanity that cares for uh, human values in that part of the world, and yet Turkey is refusing. Turkey is having, as we said, window dressing. The United mm -hmm. States' contribution to this has been airstrikes that have done virtually nothing except antagonize and, and, and provide a recruiting tool for uh, uh, ISIL and, and have had very little effect to what is on the ground. Have the okay. Kurds in the area been supplied with weapons, ammunition? No. In fact, weapons and ammunition have flowed to the ISIS flight fighters through Turkey. Through All right, very stay with me, Mr. Peterson. Borders. Let me get Mr. And, Ricard. Uh, stay with yes. me, Mr. Peterson. Let me get Mr. Ricard in on this. Mr. Ricard, your take of exactly sure. what is going on, as Mr. Peterson has said, uh, of course, the United States is involved uh, in uh, limited airstrikes that definitely have not been affected at all. And we see Turkey uh, basically doing absolutely nothing as the slaughter uh, is on its way to taking place this in the city. Terrible. We've seen the international community or some parts of it saying that it is important that anyone who can help the people in Kobani do so. So what exactly is going on? What are we seeing? What we're seeing here is we're seeing a deliberately ineffective uh, bombing campaign by NATO and their allies, including Turkey's uninvolvement. Unlike the scenario, let's say, in Kosovo 15 years ago, when in fact you had over a thousand aircraft involved and over 38,000 combat missions in 10 weeks, that's 35 or 3,800 missions a week which would be about over 500 missions a day. And then we've had less than 40 to 50 missions around Kobani alone in the past uh, four weeks. So I think what we're seeing here is a deliberate, uh, ineffective attack. And there are several reasons for this. One of the reasons is many of the, of the intelligence community operatives that are embedded with ISIS are basically directing ISIS to take out the PKK and take out the YPG. Now these groups have been at war with Turkey and the northern Kurds in Iraq for over 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, these groups are a nemesis 
but yet they're an ally to Israel because a lot of the uh, Jewish Kurds that were in northern Iraq joined the PKK and have been being helped by Israel, Spain, Italy, uh, also being helped by uh, um, the Germans. Uh, there, a lot of the weapons actually were going in through Kobani uh, and, and were being smuggled in through that area. So this has been traditionally a supply route to the PKK. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is something that uh, the NATO knows. This is something that uh, the Turks know. And it's something that uh, they're not talking about. So they're allowing ISIS, and the ISIS is being directed by the intelligence communities to go in and wipe out this particular strategic area. This strategic area is also going to be strategic for laying pipeline because the geographical plateau that it runs on uh, coming out of the, uh, what will be the Kurdish regional government. Okay. And don't be uh, confused here. This is about establishing the Kurdish regional government and, and, about, uh, and also about establishing uh, oil rights. Uh, right now, uh, today, uh, Saudi Arabia has reduced the price of oil to $60 a barrel in order to flood the market, in order to weaken Russia and Iran. So these are strategic moves. And for all the rhetoric that, uh, um, that uh, um, Mr. Peterson's talking about, this is what they're saying in the news. So this is what a lot of people are repeating. But this is not actually what is happening. Well, Mr. Peterson, what about uh, Mr. Ricard's analysis uh, of basically what he's saying is actually going on here? Your take, sir. Well, I, I think it's almost humorous. I was uh, about to say prior That's to incredibly. the last it's not statement funny of Mr. At all. Ricard calling my... Let me know when he's through and then ahead, I can Mr. continue, Peterson. please. Yes, I was about to say that I found myself uh, largely in agreement with, uh, with his analysis. And uh, I, I'm, I'm pleased that he found uh, uh, my remarks uh, humorous or uh, something uh, uh, with which he could disagree. But I don't know what I said that he would disagree with specifically. What, because essentially, uh, I concur with with the analysis largely that he gave until he uh, rang other countries in, such as the great world players Spain and Italy, providing being instigators of, uh, of violence in the world, uh, that, that, that becomes rather humorous in itself. But the point is, what we have here is a failure of leadership of the West. We have a failure of discipline in, within the, uh, the larger uh, Islamic community in order to control a very, very dangerous aberration within that, uh, within that region. We should recognize that all in humanity have an interest in controlling inhumanity and gross brutality that favors no region, no religion, except chaos and, and, and inhumanity in the world. Well, what's that, in Mr. Peterson, Mr. Oil, Peterson, please stay, stay a, with me. Mr. Yes. Peterson, sorry to interrupt you, but with what you sure. have just said, as far as everyone in the world has an interest to control inhumanity, and of course that statement, I'm sure the whole world would, inter would agree with that. However, uh, let's, let's, let's sure. describe this inhumanity and, and who has created this inhumanity and where did ISIL come from? So uh, uh, do you agree or disagree that the United States and its regional allies um, are part of the problem, if not the total problem, in actually ISIL coming to being? And if that is the case, then are we sure that Washington's goal now is really to take ISIL out, which is definitely a creation of its own? Or how do you see it, sir? No, how I see it is uh, ISIL emerged, well, has been emerging for some time. It represents an internecine conflict within Islam, I should say. Uh, it, no this, way. The, it came to a head in Iraq. It came to a head in Iraq when what the United States was attempting to do, rightly or wrongly, whether this was a highly idealized policy that was not able to work ab initio, or whether it failed due to a lack of 
continu continuity over time, attempting to introduce democratic forms within a part of the world in which those forms are very rare indeed and perhaps not able to sustain themselves. All right, we Mr. had regions me, I, I'm within sorry. Iraq. Mr. Ricard, let me just jump with, in here, uh, Mr. Ricard. I, I want to because I want to go back go to the the actual discussion at hand, of course, which is Turkey's role in all of this, and why are we seeing uh, the Turks on the one hand say that they're condemning terrorism, on the other hand, doing absolutely nothing about uh, helping the people in Kobani. On the one hand, being part of NATO. On the other hand, uh, at least allegedly or in appearance, not listening to what uh, NATO is saying and international is saying, community is saying, that needs to be done. Well, clearly Turkey is uh, in cahoots with NATO uh, by not um, helping out Kobani. Uh, Turkey, alongside NATO and Gulf state partners, are responsible for building up this mercenary force. This mercenary force has been operating with impunity uh, uh, along the uh, um, Turkish borders uh, for uh, well over uh, uh, three years. And, and in fact, a lot of these uh, organizations started in the early 2000s uh, when uh, these organizations were being pushed by the, uh, the right-wing PNAC folks, uh, guys like David Horowitz and Daniel Pipes. And they even recruited a, uh, um, a Syrian uh, co collegiate boy out of Arizona State University, who is now the head military advisor uh, at, uh, um, for the Syrian National uh, uh, Coalition. Which, by the way, this coalition was formed out of El Hasaka in the north uh, um, uh, eastern part of Syria in question now, alongside not the PKK Kurds, but the Kurds that are friendly with the Kurdish regional government that control the top third of Iraq right now. So these individuals have been working for almost a decade alongside the Qataris, the Americans, the British, the Saudis, to basically put together a mercenary force that they're responsible for now, and they have many operatives in. They are not, being, uh, 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 they are not acting willy-nilly going after Kobani. This is a strategic attack that's being coordinated by NATO and is being uh, watched by Turkey because Turkey's very happy to see the PKK getting defeated uh, by the hands of, uh, of a mercenary force that they helped build alongside of NATO. All right, stay with me, please. I want to cross over to our Facebook and see what uh, some of our viewers have to say about this subject. Erdogan and the ISIL have the same objective to destroy Kurds. Erdogan is going to commit genocide against Kurds. President Assad should unify with Kurds and help them. Turkey stood and watched 600 children get murdered in Gaza. What makes people think Turkey's going to help the Kurds? As Israel is so good at killing and taking land, they should act against the ISIL. The Turkish government is doing a good job. It's very clear that there is a link between ISIL and the Turkish government. The link is being governed by Obama. If Iran doesn't take action on Kobani, the massacre will happen. Turkey, Saudi Arabia and Qatar are nothing but Israeli and American puppets that will kill their own brothers for the sake of the West's interests. Is Turkey an international police force to help them? Why don't you call Assad to help them? Iran should act urgently. President Assad must officially request Iran to come to their aid. And what do you think, Mr. Peterson, looking at some of the comments? Uh, I want to look at the part that basically says that Turkey, Qatar, and others are actually uh, being controlled by Israel and the United States. Do you think the role that Turkey is playing right now is one that Washington wishes it to play, or no, is uh, basically Turkey acting <clears throat> up on its own by not allowing the Kurds to go to Kobani and not helping out at all in Kobani? Uh, I'll reiterate the point I made before. What we're seeing here is not a diabolical, uh, scheming, strong, uh, focused leadership on the part of, uh, in fact, on the part of Turkey, nor on the part of certainly the United States, nor on the part of NATO. What we are seeing is the lack of strong leadership that is resulting in 
regional or even local interests predominating. And we're seeing a dissolution on the frontier of the, uh, shall we say, the, the, uh, the, con the continuity of NATO to uh, sustain its own interests. And the focus of that is the failure of the United States to continue a role uh, in leadership. Not that the United States is a Svengali uh, pulling strings and dancing uh, around the region, okay. but the United States that is largely absent. Okay. That is the problem. Mr. And Ricard, I'm so sorry, so Mr. Turkey, Mr. Peterson, we only have about 30 yes. seconds left. Mr. Ricard, your take. Sure. What is it going to take? I know you disagree with the overall what's the problem. Now, what is it going to take so, uh, to, to try to alleviate this situation, especially as Kobani is under threat more and more every day? Is there some entity or somehow that pressure can be put on Ankara in order for them to open its borders and in order for them to help the Kurds in Kobani, who is in threat of being slaughtered? What it's going to take is exposure of this fallacy that they're calling a coalition. If you look at the details and the facts are, are remain that there's been very little uh, help coming out of uh, NATO and these coalition of forces or leadership that uh, Mr. Peterson refers to. Be, be fair here. Whenever there is a coalition, the United States uh, act, actually acts upon 90% of the activities. And of the bombing campaigns that have happened in, uh, in Syria, the United States has conducted over 90% of those. And there's no B-2s that are involved in, with any type of uh, uh, giant bombing campaigns. Uh, there's, there's very small, very calculated bombing campaigns, and they're not very effective, and they're deliberately not effective, because this is a calculated event to help Turkey take out the PKK. So unless you expose the fact that everyone's calling it a failure in the news, but in, behind closed doors, it is a massive success because okay. they've taken these mercenaries and they've, they've worked with intelligence communities and they're being very successful at guiding them into Kobani. All right, on that note, so sorry, we're out of time. I'd like to thank both my guests, Mr. Frederick Peterson out of Washington, Congressional Defense Policy Advisor, and Mr. Scott Ricard out of Orlando, former American intelligence linguist. And we thank you for being with us on another debate. I'm Marzia Hashimi, signing out. Thanks and goodbye.